Okay, guys, I have uh, chapter 27 of Lemons, and it's titled Cruel and Unusual. We're in big trouble. I mean, big trouble. Like trouble with a capital T and an exclamation point at the end. What were you thinking? That was from Debbie. Once the sun comes up that morning, she's still wearing her pajamas and matching robe with little yellow flowers on it. Her hair is, her hair is all messed up. She has black mascara smudged under her eyes. And there's more red around the rims than normal. Tobin and Charlie and I are all sitting around Charlie's kitchen table while Debbie paces the floor back and forth. Mom, Tobin protests. You don't understand. They were howling. And I'm a scientist. What choice did I have, really? I don't care if they were performing the two-step to when Santa comes marching in, she tells him with her hands on her hips. Tobin looks at me confused. Two-step? Mom, the Bigfoot have opposable thumbs, but I'm fairly sure they can't dance that. Tobin! Yes, ma'am, he says, looking at his shoes. We care about you and lemonade. We care about your safety. That's why we set these rules. Yes, ma'am, he says again. Charlie's stroking his beard and looking out the window while he silently sips his coffee. There were rules, uh, Tobin's mom goes on. Rules for a reason, and you didn't follow them. I'm sorry, Debbie. I say, me too, Bob. We promise we won't go past the fence next time. Next time? Tobin's mom says with a snort that sounds like a laugh, but really isn't one. There won't be a next time, young man. You're grounded. And no going to the Bigfoot headquarters for one week. A whole week? Tobin shouts desperately, standing straight up. What about the neighbors? The sightings? Mrs. Dickerson? They need us. We'll have to find a way to get along with you. Right, Charlie? Charlie looks at Debbie and nods slowly and takes another long drink from his mug. I could actually use some store of the help this week, he says quietly. I've got some shipments coming in. You guys can spend the week there. It's settled then. Debbie bobs her head down like she's putting a period at the end of the thought. I don't ever want to go through this again. You won't, Debbie, I say. We promise. Right, Tobin? On the day of a Bigfoot science, I find this pun punishment cruel and unusual for the following reasons. He starts holding out his fingers to make the list, and I poke him hard with my elbow. Ow! And then he sits down in his chair and folds his arms. Tobin, Debbie says again, I hope we understand each other. Yeah, okay, he says with his chin on his chest. After a hot, bubbleless bath, the same old boring bar of Irish Spring and a plain blue washcloth. I spend the rest of the Sunday afternoon in my room. Another penalty dulled out during the judgment phase of our kitchen table trial. I reread all the letters from San Francisco five times each. I have eight now. Two more from Erica Voss and one from Shelley H. and one from Melanie, too. Erica had her summer dance recital and Melanie's mom had the baby. It was a girl. Melanie says it screams all night long, so she started wearing cotton balls in her ears. While I'm rereading Miss Cotton's letters, Charlie knocks softly on the door, and I slip the letters in the drawer of the night table. Come in, I call. Charlie comes in, and he sits down next to me, and he hands me a book. I ordered this for you back at the store. I look at the front and back. Thanks, Charlie, I say. It's supposed to be a good one for a girl your age, he says. It has a cat and a mouse on the cover, and it's called The Cricket in Times Square. I love cats, I tell him. I also want to let you know when I lay down rules, I expect you to follow. Yes, Charlie. The rules aren't to ruin your fun, they're for your safety and what I think's best for you. I know, I say as I feel a lump coming up in my throat. I, I really, I'm really sorry. I want to tell him it was all Tobin's fault anyway. He was the one who had to go running into the woods after that thing in the pouring rain. All I wanted to do was make a break for the house and hide under a warm blanket until the thunder stopped rumbling. But I don't tell Charlie any of it, mostly because it would make me sound like a big fat chicken. It won't happen again, I promise. I hope not, he says. I fold down page 55 of my book and go to the bedroom door to listen. After hearing the faint sounds of the news on the television in the living room, I tiptoe over to the big trunk at the end of the bed. I wrap my fingers around the edge and then pinch the top up little by little. It gripes and groans until it finally gives way. I stop and take a deep breath. I push the lid all the way and pinch the top. 
to stare at the carefully folded piles. I'm afraid to touch anything. There's children's clothes and toys and games. They're stuffed animals, and they're carefully placed in perfect rows. The cedar escapes into the room and penetrates the air. I know they're hers. I know without even asking the question. The lump starts up in my throat again, and I quickly close the lid, making sure it's shut tight so the memories don't escape, and so the sadness stuck in my throat can't suck me into the quicksand. Sadness, quicksand, that's deep and scary. So deep and scary that I'm afraid one day I won't be able to come back from it.